Uh, my name is Professor Mark Hulls. I'm, uh, as, uh, as Ramon mentioned, fairly new at, at KTH, and head up a, a division that looks at what we call energy systems analysis. Um, now, my, my background includes having worked with the UN system of organizations for some time. And in that, in that role, I was involved in working with governments, think about how to plan their energy systems into the future, so the next 20, 30, 40 years. And uh, specifically, trying to bridge the gap between technology and what technologies are going to work where, and the kind of policy that needs to get developed in order to see those technologies, uh, technologies implemented. Another thing that we, uh, we spent a fair amount of time doing was training people to be able to do this themselves, because uh, a key thing is, is empowering people to, to do that into the future, and then developing some of the tools that, that people use to do that. Now, um, it's kind of in that context that, that I've moved to, to KTH, and I'm still involved in developing and supporting tools that these international organizations need in order to be able to engage with uh, with their member states. Now, one of the things that uh, I was asked about, uh, asked to talk about, was uh, the energy system and sustainability. I don't know how many times I've heard the term sustainability today, and I'm pretty convinced that every time anybody mentioned it, they were thinking something different to the speaker before them, and we were all receiving a mildly, a mildly different, different message. But I think intuitively, we've got some idea that. Uh, you know, we want to last on this planet for a few more generations at least, and we've got to think about the way we manage our, our resources smartly. Something that gets an inordinate amount, of, but a very important amount of attention is, uh, is climate change. Clearly, we, we need to start reducing our emissions and think about how to reduce them. We also need to think about the effect of climate change. Um, there are a whole bunch of energy systems that just aren't going to work into the future if the climate changes. Forestry might be a great carbon sequestration uh, thing to do right now, but if, if the climate changes drastically enough, and maybe areas in the world where we have forests ain't going to be forested anymore. Um, the, US, uh, the US military recently uh, released a, a list of things that uh, they saw as a potential uh, nexus points for, for big conflict over the next 10 to 20 years. And it was a short list. There was only about 10 things on the list, but three of them were kind of key. The first was oil reserves and their location, energy reserves generally. The second was um, the kind of increased interdependency and tension that's creating because we're fighting over a smaller amount of resource. And the last one was the difference between the haves and the have-nots. And it's this that I want to pick up in this particular talk, because I think this is a, a crucial thing that we have to address when we think about one of the obstacles to achieving um, future sustainability in the world. Now, uh, it's something like 1.4 billion people do not have access to electricity at the moment. Close to 3 billion people are unable to heat their homes with modern forms of energy. And uh, as a result, respiratory disease is a huge problem in a lot of uh, least developed and develop developing countries. To the tune of a million people a, a year die because of these, these uh, smoke-related respiratory diseases. So in eight years, that's the population of Sweden gone, which is pretty drastic. So we've got to think about addressing some of these very, very basic issues when we look at sustainability, as well as some of the longer-term issues that are, that are clearly important, such as such as climate change. So um, where do we look to try and think about uh, reducing risk, increasing security, and uh, worry about a functioning society? Funnily enough, this guy, Winston Churchill, was one of the first people in the world to think about the energy system in a, uh, in a systematic way when it comes to reducing risk. The context was, uh, this was just before the, well, this was during the First World War, Churchill was in charge of the British naval fleet, and he realized that the naval fleet could work a lot better if it converted from coal, and Britain had a lot of coal at the time, to oil. Okay, you could get faster ships than, than the Germans who they were fighting. And uh, the thing was, is to get a reliable, secure supply of oil to these, to these ships was no, in no way trivial. The oil came from a, from a volatile part of the world, as much of it still does now. And uh, he spent some time thinking about it and decided that uh, diversification was just a key thing to improving uh, security and avoiding risk. And so with this in mind, we apply some of these principles and start to think about, um, let's say, the bottom billion. Now, next year in the UN, in the UN system of organizations is going to be the year of energy access. 
Uh, we thought it would be smart to do some work, and we're doing this together with the International Renewable Energy Agency, to look at how to electrify Africa. Can we do at least three things? The first thing is, is come up with a smart way of being able to supply Africa with its future energy needs. Now, Africa is resource rich. That means that in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see mining activities grow tremendously, which means a massive increase in the demand for, uh, for, for energy because mining is, is resource intensive. Um, can we do it in a smart way? The African energy system, for better or worse, is not very, very well developed. So do they have to go through this whole traditional um, setup of developing large infrastructure uh, networks and adding power plants to it or not? Or can we do some leapfrogging? The uh, example of cell phones is often used. In Africa, most people have access to a, to a cell phone, and they never went through this whole, this whole step of laying landlines and having traditional phones. And if you think about it, that's, that's really quite, quite a powerful image, and I want to come back to that later. And the last thing is, is that, you know, on the one hand, there are these, there are these needs to be met, and uh, there is a social aspect of sustainability and an environmental aspect that's important. But can this be done in an economic way? Is there a business case to be had for looking at uh, electrifying Africa into the future? And we argue very strongly yes, and think that this should be a big motivator for a lot of the, the research and development that goes on in um, technology centers such as Sweden, and uh, more on that in a minute. So, so what we did to try, and, um, to try and have a look at Africa's potential together with uh, the Renewable Energy Agency was to start off with just mapping the renewable resources that the continent has. And to our utter kind of surprise on the one hand and um, maybe a little bit of indignation on the other, we found that you know, nobody had done a proper resource en uh, renewable energy resource map of Africa. And what this revealed was that, you know, we've got one, there's one country on the east side of Africa that has something like 40 gigawatts of potential of wind energy with a load factor of over 37%. And I saw some of you glaze over there. That just means there's damn good renewable wind potential on one side of the country. On the other side, there's a similar potential for, for hydro, the hydropower. Up in the north, huge potential for, for solar. And so we put these numbers together, and then we developed uh, using some of the most sophisticated software in the world that's used to look at uh, investment planning and uh, uh, energy planning uh, anywhere. We developed a multi-regional model of Africa to figure out what investments could go where and what kinds of trade could be done where, to, 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 to just to see what, what would be the optimal mix into the future and uh, what investment opportunities there were. And the results that came out were telling the African energy system in the next 30 years is going to grow uh, to three times the size that it is now. Now, that's not really that big because it's not, it's not such a big system. It's, uh, it's sizable, though, and the growth is tremendous. And if we have a look at what the most economic things are for people to invest in, most of them are renewable. They're split between um, uh, hydro, wind, and solar. So we've got like this massive market for clean technology, that's, that's right there, and uh, perhaps not the, not the know-how how to deploy it as well as it, as it could be deployed. And this is where the next phase of research comes in that's, that's interesting. I keep talking about market potential. Um, one of the characteristics of the way some mining is taking place in a lot of African countries is that uh, a state-owned company or a large company will come in, develop a mine, it'll ship in a massive diesel generator to generate the electricity that's needed, do the mining, ship out the generator, and disappear. And they do this for reasons of risk and a couple of other things. But if you run through the economics with the oil prices we have right now, these are incredibly expensive. So if you could get the market structures right and get the right clean tech in there, there's... Uh, there's the potential to do a lot of good, introduce a lot of uh, renewable energy sources, which will cut down energy bills for people into the future, reduce emissions, which is great, and you have this uh, large market for clean tech uh, producers. So what does this mean? It means that we've got to start doing some serious, serious thinking, and I would suggest that uh, places like Sweden are really well placed to, to do this sort of thinking. Uh, somebody at a meeting in the International Energy Agency that I was at on Monday suggested that one of the problems that Africa has is that, uh, yeah, sure, there's all of this potential, but it doesn't want to risk uh, first-mover disadvantages. 
In other words, it, uh, it's going to take a fair, you're going to need case studies and ideas of how to develop an energy system that, that leapfrogs traditional development. And Africa's not going to do it itself. It's way too risky. So the idea that um, these models could be developed in, in Europe and potentially shipped is, uh, is important. And the things that we have to look at are, A, technology development, new technologies that can uh, take, uh, take, place, uh, take part in various markets. Uh, oh, and by the way, it, it's really interesting. We could develop technologies, put them in place, and these technologies can have functionality that people don't know about. But in the future, they may well use. What a lot of you folk in this room don't know is that if you're purchasing a fridge right now, some of those fridges even have uh, smart controllers in them that you don't know about, you, and you're not going to know about for, for a little while. But these smart controllers are set up so that at some point, Somebody is going to be able to turn your fridge off or turn the, change the cycling ability very quickly just to be able to help regulate frequency on the electricity, on the electricity grid. Now, we can think about uh, that's, that's a, smart, uh, a smart grid option that's potentially suitable for, for, for Europe, certainly parts of Africa. And we, we put together a list of these smart technologies that could be developed without too much thinking that uh, could be put in place in an African market that people don't even have to know about, but in the future make a really profitable case for, uh, for the clean tech companies. Smart financing is something else that's neat. You know, in Kenya, there are wood fuel markets in Kenya that are controlled by, by mobile phones. Uh, somebody will send a message. There'll be, be half a day's walk away to the market to find out whether or not there's any charcoal available. And if there is charcoal, then they'll use their cell phone to do the banking to buy the charcoal, so then they can go over and collect it later on. And that kind of technology or those kind of options for doing more intelligent things with the energy system can be really, really smart. We can have very clever ways of delivering subsidies and doing kinds of billing for, um, for services rather than just supplying the energy. If you think about it, at the moment, the way we sell electricity is incredibly crude and backwards. We pay for a kilowatt hour of electricity. And uh, if you think about a setting like this, that means that you're paying the same amount of money to keep a life support system running as you are for some rich guy to have his television switched on. Okay? And that's, that's just the, the disparity there is big. However, I have to say, being, being from Africa and uh, seeing how enthusiastic people are about, uh, about soccer, maybe a television and a life support system are quite close when it comes to World Cup finals and so on. But anyway, innovative uh, financing schemes are something that, that are key. Helping to develop tools that are going to be useful for governments to make their own decisions and to think about how to plan this leapfrogging is super important. When I was in this, this UN system, we did this a fair amount, and it was shocking how um, stereotypes permeate the way we think. Um, in, in fact, I, I, I was kind of told that, you know, energy planning in Africa, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Until I remember one day getting a, a phone call at 3 in the morning when some guy couldn't get his computer model to run because he wasn't representing solar panels in it properly. And I thought, nah, it's not a challenge. We've got to develop the right kind of tools and get them out there uh, smartly. And then the last thing that I want to... Uh, come to is uh, I spoke about cell phones and cell phones being an absolutely clear example of how technology leapfrogging can take place. And uh, people often apply this to energy transitions and other transitions in, in poor countries. But one of the things that cell phones came with, and I'm really happy that the, 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 the previous speaker mentioned this, is with some level of standardization. The cell phone companies knew that if they charged a certain amount of money for uh, the use of a phone per month or for a certain amount of airtime, that they'd be able to cover the cost of the appliance, the phone, the cost of the antennas and other things, the, the transmission uh, infrastructure, in a clever way. And they could share this with other people coming into the market as well. So you could have several mobile phone companies operating on the same uh, sets of technology, but the customers were billed uh, for things that they wanted. Right. And this is a radical departure from the standard way that governments have uh, put energy infrastructure in place, where they just fit it and then forget about it, and the market takes, uh, takes care of itself. And I'd suggest one of the biggest challenges we have today is to think about how to develop this kind of standardized system that could be, could be put together in a, in a smart way. So... Um, Unfortunately, there's, there's, there's not more time because there are a lot of really interesting elements that I think 
uh, it just lends itself to the kind of challenges that would be very well addressed by um, researchers in places like, like KTH. So um, in summary, sustainability has a number of really important challenges. I'd like to suggest that uh, one of the biggest is helping look after the, the, the bottom billion in, in society and improving access to, uh, to electricity. In actual fact, providing sustainable energy for the bottom billion could be massive industry for the clean tech technology, uh, for clean tech companies. And this is something where there's a challenge that people have to rise to because it requires that we have to set up um, models of how these systems could grow organically. This uh, infrastructure is not going to be developed necessarily in the same way as it's been developed historically in Europe or the States or Japan or or, or developed countries. And so that's the, that's the challenge for, for you and the, the challenge for us, and um, hopefully something to, to, to talk about over, over a glass or two of wine a little bit later on. And by the way, thank you very much. I had a, a difficult session just between lunch and coffee break, and I, I didn't notice too many people nodding off. So if there are any questions. Okay, yes. thank you very much, Mark.